today, we're looking at 7 through 10. He comes back in verse 7 with another truly, truly. And what's interesting about these two truly, trulys, they're actually one doctrine. They're actually one doctrine. Normally, uh, they're one messianic point. Normally, you have a truly, truly I say to you, there's a point within the truly, truly I say to you. But this one, notice in the first six verses we talked about it, he doesn't identify it. In verse 1, he says, truly, truly I say to you, he who does not, he who does not enter by the door into the fold, the sheepfold, but climbs up some other way. But, verse 2, he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. He never identifies it. He never identifies uh, who could be the Messiah there. But in verse 7, he does. He, he does it in verse 7. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door. Now, he's talked about the sheep door. The, you remember that the sheep pen, now this is really important to this point, the sheep pen had three sides. And in the three sides, which were walled, right? Because if you didn't go by the door, you had to climb up over something. Agreed? Right? The, and they didn't have a door like we have a door. They just had a doorway. And it didn't have doors on it as we understand doors. It was a gateway into the sheep pen. And uh, the shepherds always guarded that door. And if the shepherd didn't, they posted a guard there. They hired people that, and they're described as gatekeepers here in the first six verses. They hired somebody to be a night security person. And he stood in that gate to keep the sheep in and the enemy out. Um, so that's important. So what he says is he's the door. Uh, John is really going to push that, isn't he? I mean, John, probably the most famous line with Christ connected is John 14, 6, isn't it? I am the way, the truth. I am the way, the truth, and life. Uh, but here, I am the door, and, and drop down in next week's lesson from 11 through 21. Notice what he says. He says, I am the good shepherd. Notice that he has established the fact that both of these two things go together, the door and the shepherd. Agreed? The door. Listen, the door is for the shepherd. The sheep go in and the shepherd guards them. The sheep go out and the shepherd guards them. Agreed? That's the job of the shepherd. And so he says, not only am I the door, but I'm the good shepherd. So he, now he's got it. So he, 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 he's in a transition from chapter 9 to chapter 10 in the first six verses, and now he gets into it. So today he says... I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, watch this now, boy. Man, he, he's going to have, he's going to stir up a hornet's nest. I am the door. If anyone, listen, when we say to that to people, they just think we're not eating a fruitcake. When we say that Jesus is the only way to God, they think we're crazy. Everybody, listen, you, know, you mean all these religions are wrong? Uh, I don't know, wrong in what way? If you're talking about having a relationship with God, they're wrong. Are you talking about doing some kind of religious work? Then they're right. They're right about their religious work, but that, that work can't get them saved. And so, right? Right? So we get, we get accused because we say there's only one way to God, and that's through his son, Jesus Christ, and they, they, they poo us, whatever that is, right? That, that's what they do. All right, so he says, I am the door. He says it twice. I am the door of the sheep. I am the door. If anyone, if anyone, that's really going to be important because in John, John 10, 16, he's going he's gonna to bring this back up. So pay attention to that. I, it won't be today. It'll be next week. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he shall be saved. Watch this. Uh, and when he's saved, he's going to go in and out and find pasture. Now, pay attention to that. He's going to go in, right? Jesus Christ, I am the door. 
of the, I am the door of the sheepfold. I, I save the sheep. The sheep that are saved are going to go in and out by my, the, I'm going to lead them. I'm going to lead them in. I'm going to lead them out. I'm going to lead them to pasture. That's what sheep have to have. And, and pay attention to that pasture. The thief comes. This is how the shepherd is different than the thief. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came, the shepherd, I came that they might have, watch this now, life, save for life to pasture. And no, notice what the life is called because of its connection to the pasture. It's called the abundant. You know who? You know who, who, who led and fed? Who led and fed the sheep? You know who that is? That's the shepherd. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. You know that's true with your life. Oh, you're all about him feeding you. Oh, I got that part. But what about leading you? Huh? Oh, I know you want, you want all the gifts with no strings, and that is grace. But listen, the, the shepherd, the shepherd saves you to lead you in and lead you out to find, to find the pasture of life that is abundant. That's over and beyond what you could imagine. Are you there today? Is your life over and above what you could imagine? Now, be truthful. I'm not, you know, this is not a test for me. It should be. You were saved for that. Didn't he not? The, I, I saved the sheep to put him in and out of pasture where the abundant life is. I have come to give you the abundant life. I, that means over and above what you could have ever imagined. Are you there? The question is, why not? Are you saved? Yes, sir. Do you believe the Lord is the director, that he directs your life? Do you believe that he should be the lead part to your life? Yes, sir. Listen, there's two parts here, led and fed. So we're going to talk about that day after a word of prayer. Let's pray. I gave you a moment of silence as a believer a priest and dwelt by the Holy Spirit the privilege to confess sin if necessary. Why is that important? Because you can't study the Bible in carnality. How do you know carnality? Identifying personal sin in your life. The Holy Spirit's job is to bring it to your, call it, call it to your attention. Your attention is to confess it. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just. And what's, why is that important? Spirituality. Can't study the Bible in carnality. Can't study it. You, well, you can study it, but you can't get anything from it. Father, we're so thankful for these that have come our way today. May we come to understand that we're saved, to, go, to be led and fed, which results in the abundant life, over and above what we could have ever imagined. Over and above. That's the word abundantly. I gave you Zoe life. I gave you the life of God so that you could experience in the human realm a life that is beyond and above anything you could have imagined. And not just imagine at one time in your life, but imagine every day of your life. Are you kidding me, Father? Is that the truth? Yep. <laughs> yep, that's what it means for Jesus to be your shepherd. That's what it means for him to be your door. Teach us today, Father. Teach us today to embrace the abundant life, the Zoe life. Other people call it eternal life, but it's the life of God in the dynamics of the daily living. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's take a look at a few things. Uh, next week, we'll get into this in a further discussion on the Good Shepherd's Rule, but he introduces it to us in great lengths today. In uh, lesson one, we learned that 
the whole chapter that we're after, verse, first 21 verses, is, is attached to, the, to chapter 9, which is a long chapter. When you realize chapter 9, and, and when you look at chapter 9, it's a pretty healthy chapter. When you add 21 verses to it, it becomes one of the longest, longest chapter concepts or stories, uh, and it's one of the great truly, truly stories uh, of John's writing. And, and it's really important you put both that whole stretch together when you do that. Now, here's what's kind of interesting to me, and I want to remind you of things that we studied. For example, in John, the ninth chapter, if you would with me for just a moment, Jesus is going by, and this is where this whole thing started. They're traveling, going from one gig to another, right? One ministry to another. And he sees this blind man. And he must slow down, you know, like, like you might if there was a wreck or something. Slows it down because what he's looking at is an observation. He's making an observation. The disciples' ears pick up because he's slowed down making an observation of something. They all look over there. Oh, well, it's the blind man. Let me tell you, in an apostate nation, there was a lot of them because sickness is one of the big things that came in the cycle of discipline to a nation. And so it wasn't, I mean, he had a lot of people. He had a lot of people to heal, and he only healed a few of them, right? He didn't heal them all. He healed a few. He picked and chose them because he wanted to display God's mighty power, mighty work. He, he's going to tell us that. But in this passage, he sees, and, and this whole thing starts with the disciple asking him a question. Now, they think they have the answer. This is one of those questions that I'm going to get an A on. Because I got the answer. That's typical pharisaical thinking, by the way. They never ask Jesus a question to learn anything always to trap him. His disciples ask him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned? Listen, this man or his parents, this, you know, multiple choice here. One of them is the correct answer, Lord. They think they've got him too. Because either way they got it, actually they believe that both. So they think they've got, they've got 100 on the test right here. And boy, did he throw them a curve. Because look at what he told them. He said, neither. <laughs> Don't you know that rocked them back on their heels? Neither. Uh No. I've been, t listen, here's what their mind is saying. I've been taught all my life that sickness and disease and bad things coming to your life is because of sin. How is it possible that this man born blind from birth, that it's not, it's either his parents' fault or his fault, it's got to be one of them. Jesus says neither of them. <laughs> There's a learning curve. But listen what he told them, because he knows they'll never get this. They'll never get this one. So rather than, because they're back on their heels. <laughs> So he says, listen to what he says. It was neither this man's sin nor his parents. You would have thought by now, these disciples that he picked up in chapter, like chapter 2 of John, been running with him pretty heavy, seeing him do unbelievable miracles, would have understood that this was, was Jesus of Nazareth the Messiah, 
the Savior of Israel and the world. You would have thought that, and you would have been wrong. And so he tells them, let me tell you what you've been missing traveling with me. What you've been missing while you've been traveling with him. It was neither this man's sin nor his parents, but it was in order that the works of God might be displayed in him. Talking about the blind man. That the work, now what is the work of God that Jesus, what is the work of God, the work of God that Jesus, Jesus is going to, through his faith, ex display on this blind man? We call it a miracle. You know what Jesus called it? Just a work of God. Just another day at the office, just a routine day. For us, and for the blind man, it was a miracle. I understand that. But you know what it was for Jesus? The work of God. The work of God. Yes, that's why I've come into the world. I've come into the world to do the work of God. But that's not the work I've come to do. I didn't come to heal the sick and the blind. He came to die on a cross for the sins of mankind. They can't even get the miracle part. How are they ever going to get this, the, the main part? They don't even see him. They don't even understand the miracles he's doing are identifying. They're, they're, his, they're, his, they're his credit card business to identify that he's Christ. Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, say, Here, here's what you should look for. The guy who can do all these things, he's the guy. And, he, and, and listen, he keeps saying to the Jewish people who are always looking for signs, which of these have I not done? What, Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, what have I not done? Which one of these have I not done? And finally, he says, an evil, adulterous generation will get no more signs but one. I will give you the sign of Jonah three days and three nights. You see, these people were looking for signs. They were using them against the plan of God, not for it. They were using it against it. Because when he gave them the sign of Jonah, the last sign, the last sign that he would give Israel was his resurrection, and they blew it off. <laughs> this isn't God long suffering and patient with us. These are hand picked guys. Just like you, just like me. We've been hand picked. And a lot of people standing around us looking at us going, what? Whoa. He must have been having a bad day when he picked Ron. He must have been having a bad day when he got Peter. Listen, he sees more hope in you than you will ever see in yourself. He sees more potential in you than you have ever seen in yourself. He sees more ministry in you than you see. Listen, you don't even think you have any ministry, and yet here you are saved, being led and fed by the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's for one purpose, that you could have great ministry. You're a priest. You're a priest to the believer. You're an ambassador to the world. That's just a start. You're an heir. You have an inheritance. I mean, the list goes on, the 50 things. 20 of them are status privileges, you pay no attention to in your life. Oh, I'm just a nobody. I'm just this and I'm just that. The Lord never gives me this. And never. <laughs> yeah? Do you know the 20 things that you have positionally in Christ that you can, you can collect on? Do you know them? I tell you, if you don't know them, you don't have them operational in your life. They're there. 
you're an heir. What does that mean to you when you have an inheritance? What does that mean to you? It means something you're going to get when you die? No, an inheritance is something you get when somebody else dies. Just for a starter. And do you know what kind of priesthood you have? It's the priesthood of Jesus Christ. His priesthood is not after Levi, it's after Melchizedek. And your priesthood is after neither of them, it's after Jesus Christ. He sets the standard of what it means to be a priest. I just mentioned two of the 20. How you can live out what you don't know? I'm not picking on you, I'm just saying, what, what are you waiting on? I'm not, I'm not trying to pick on you, I'm just trying to shake the bushes a little bit. So I find that in the first three verses of chapter 9, but in order that the works of God might be displayed in him. In, isn't that interesting, displayed in him? How was the work of God that Jesus is about to do going to be displayed in this blind man from birth? Listen, he, he's going to be healed. He's going to be absolutely 100%. 100% cured. I mean, a guy who didn't have anything going on, you know, if you don't have any eyes that are working, what are, I mean, you just don't have any. And they're all put back, boom. Not, this is not, not a long problem. We're not going through operations and then four months of rehab, rehabilitation and then we'll see how well your sight is and all that. I'm talking about boom, bang, beam. <laughs> you understand how quick this happened? Just like that. In a twinkling of an eye. There it is. Perfect. <laughs> I mean, that would stagger me, wouldn't it, you? Would that not, would that not kind of like shake your little world a little bit? If you stood there and watched that and it goes like, whoa. Got in there. Look at verse 34 in chapter 9. Look at verse 34. In verse 34, the Pharisees were in court. In verse 33, if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. That's, that's the blind man. They answered and said to the blind, the healed blind man, you were... <laughs> I'm a legalist. They're the worst. You were born entirely in sin. And are you teaching us? Yes. You know what you missed, Pharisees? We're all born in sin. How about that? Romans, the third chapter, verse 22. We're all born in sin. Even you who are seen are born in sin as well. We're all born in sin. Romans, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All, not some. <laughs> all have sinned. All have sinned. All have, listen to me, all have sinned but one. And that's the one that went to the cross and made it possible for you to have the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5.21 He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. <laughs> Do you know that's what, listen to me, you've got a lot of people that you're connected with that need to hear that from your lips. I needed to hear it from somebody on my level tell me that. When I had somebody on my level tell me that, not somebody on a bigger level, a pastor, you know, not, not a priest or something, tell me that. When I had somebody on my level tell me that, somebody, you know, tell me that, I asked a whole lot of questions. I paid a whole lot of attention. And there's somebody in your periphery, they want to hear you tell them that. They want to hear you tell them that. Don't drag them off to me. You tell them, then drag them off to me. They want to hear it. 
They want to hear it from a pure level of understanding. Look at verse 41. Then I'm going to get into this. Jesus said to them, the Pharisees, look at verse 39. The, 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 the blind man, wasn't. he knew he got healed, and he knew the man that healed him was Jesus. Jesus is having a conversation with him now after he was excommunicated. And, and he, said, he said, you know, I don't know, I don't know who, who, really who, and so he explains, you have seen him, and he is the one who's talking with you, the Messiah. And he, and he says, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. Jesus said, for judgment, verse 39, watch this now, for judgment, not only for healing, but for judgment. The blind man, he, he, he's been healed and now been saved. Do you know this that order? And for judgment, now he's going to turn to the Pharisees. He says, for judgment, I came into this world that those who do not see may see and that those who see may become blind. See, he's talking to the Pharisees now. And the Pharisees who were with him heard these things. They said, uh, we are not blind too, are we? <laughs> How about a bat? Bl blinder than a bat. We are not blind too, are we? Jesus said to them, look, I love how he deals with people. If you were blind, you would have no sin. But since you say we see, your sin remains. Isn't that something? You know why? They reject Christ as the Messiah. They reject Christ as the Savior. He told the man here, listen, if you believe, you can be saved. And the guy says, I believe. Listen, this was after he was healed. He didn't say you got to do it to be healed. I love how he separated those two things in this man's life. Now, the Pharisees, what were they blind to? Legalism. 2 Corinthians 4th chapter 3 and 4. Satan blinds the minds of the ones who are not believing, the unbelieving ones, ones who are turning away from the truth of the word of God regarding Christ. He goes on to tell you that in that passage. Just says it a different way. Listen, this is an old worn out argument the Pharisees have. Look, why are you doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? That's, that's their problem. Their attitude was, if you do anything on the Sabbath, you can't be from God. See, that's the ninth chapter, verse 16. Their conclusion was that it doesn't matter if it's a miracle. It doesn't matter if it's a prophet. It doesn't matter if it's done on the Sabbath. It's all sinful. Jesus tells them, you know, you're wrong theologically. He does this in Mark, the second chapter, verse 24 through 28. He says, the Sabbath was not made for man. The, I mean, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. They never got that. They never understood the seventh day was about Christ. Six days for man and one day for salvation. Never understood it. Never understood it to enter the grace, the grace of eternal life through the man of Christ. They, they never got it. They, and they haven't got it yet. Jesus said, no, that's not the way it works. In Colossians, the second chapter, verse 16, Paul is fighting this in the church. He's fighting legalism in the church. He's fighting legalism in the church. I've spent 44 years in this church fighting legalism in the church. I get more heat mail over grace than any doctrine I teach. And it's a privilege. In Colossians, the second chapter, he says, let no one act, let no person act as your judge in regard to the Sabbath. I might add tithing to that as well. But we're, we, we've got sacred cows in the church that people all screwed up with. Remember that John, the 10th chapter, 1 through 21, is based on this figure of speech that I mentioned earlier. And the secret of that, it runs parallel ideas, which is the blind man with the Pharisees. These are, these are parallel. 
of positive and how positive and negative volition respond to the truth of the word of God. They're parallel. And the, the, because it's a figure of speech, the doctrine is hidden in it. And those who have negative volition never get the doctrine and that never understand what the message has been hidden. And people with positive volition get it. The Pharisees never got it. They went from people who could see to blind. The man who did get it with positive volition went from blindness to a person who could see and could see clearly. And so it is the story of our life, isn't it? It's the story of our life. The Pharisees' negative view are referred to as thieves and robbers of the sheep, contrasted with Jesus' positive volition view of the true shepherd of the sheep. The healed blind man became the test of volition. In this whole story, it is the blind man. The blind man became the test of volition, positive or negative volition, and we saw in detail he went positive. He went positive not just to the healing, but to the person who healed him when he found out, explained to him that he was the Messiah, the Savior of the world. He said, I'm in. I'm in. Like you and I. The, the man's famous line, the blind man, one thing I, I do know, though I was blind, now I see. The second time we hear him with any information, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. But when you look at the Pharisees, they don't get it. They don't get the Messiah. Jesus says, you know what? You don't understand why he came into the world. You do not understand why he came into the world. Listen to what he said. For judgment, I came into this world. Verse 39 of ninth chapter. For judgment, I came into this world that those who do not see may see and that those who see may become blind. Do you... Do you see what he said? No? Nah? Well, listen. See, listen to me. Do you look back up there in verse 39? Do you see the words that those? Do you see that? It's used twice. In contrast. That those who do not, that who do not see may see. That's positive volition. That's that's the blind man. And those who see may become blind. That's the Pharisees. And the Pharisees understood what he was talking about. They said, do you consider us blind? And he says, well, here's what I consider. Here's what I consider. And he, and he lays on them verse 41. This is what I consider. This is what I consider. Okay? So let's look at four aspects of this. Let me introduce the first point before we take a break. In John 10, two truly, truly sayings, verse 1 and verse 7, are given with mess one messianic doctrinal principle. It's hidden, though, in a figurative speech, whether it be a parable, an allegory, or in this case, a figure of speech that runs two things parallel. It does not matter if you have these. It's a hidden message. It's not hidden to people with positive volition because if they desire to see it, they can see it, right? Oh, yeah, he says this. But those who are blind even though they have eye, eyes and could see it, are blind if they don't see it. If they don't see it, they're blind. They're spiritually blind. They don't see it because they don't want to see it. That's an interesting point that he makes about this. In this hidden principle is the idea that Jesus Christ is the only source of God's grace salvation. That's the bottom line of it. That's the bottom line. And why did he do these miracles? Why did he heal this guy? The wonderful part is the guy got saved. How about that? Didn't get saved because he was, because he was blind. He got it because he believed. It wasn't because he could. <laughs> You're not going to get saved because you see. You're going to get saved because you believe. He believed. For by grace are you saved through faith, and in not of yourself it is a gift of God, not of works. You got saved like we all get saved. You get saved because you believe, not because you see or do. I am the door of the sheep in verse 7. This is a, 
a, a great idea that John picks up and runs from this point on. I am the good shepherd in verse 11. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Oh, will that be a study next week? God sent Jesus to Israel. Listen, he sent him to Israel. His first stop was Israel. The next stop is the world. Listen to me now. Don't miss this. His first stop is Israel. He stops at Israel. He's, this is where he stops. He comes from heaven to the earth, right? The virgin birth, I know. But his first stop is Israel. Right? That's his birth. That's his incarnation. When he goes to the cross, it's for the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his own... For God so loved the world that he gave... The, for God so loved the world that he gave. Came for Israel first. Prophetically, it had to be. To die for the world. That's what he's talking about. God sent Jesus to Israel to seek and to save the lost sheep of Israel. This is the story of Luke 15. There are, three, there are three parts to the parable of Luke 15. They all deal with the same subject, the lost sheep to Israel. And you know how they get there? Listen, every one of them, when you, when you, you know, you got the lost sheep, you got the lost coin, you got the lost sons. Lost sons. And do you know what the secret to both of them are? Listen, the secret is that, that I came to seek and to save that which is lost. And, when, and, and when, when, when they get found and believe in Christ, the Savior of the world, there's rejoicing in heaven. Is that not the truth? And there ought to be. That, listen, there's rejoicing in heaven with the angels in the first two parts of the parable. Agreed? But you know where the last one is? On earth. And while we know from this parable that when a person gets saved, there's rejoicing, there's a celebration in heaven, there ought to be one on earth. Those of us who pray for people, who and when they get saved, there ought to be a celebration, there ought to be a, there ought to be a party. There's one in heaven. There's a party. There ought to be one on earth. I've been to some of those. I've been some to, we have birth showers, we have birth this and birth that. We get born in the church, we go, like, no deal. It is a big deal. It's a bigger deal than most of us think about. And when I was in my first pastorate, we did it. We did it all the time. When somebody got saved, we had a party. It was based on that principle. We weren't looking for members. We didn't listen. People, churches celebrate when people join the church. They don't celebrate when they don't get they don't celebrate when they get saved. That don't make any sense to me. But anyhow, a lot of things don't make sense to me. I love this one. You know, he, and we know he came to the lost sheep of Israel. In fact, Jesus, when he sends his disciples, he sends them to the lost sheep of Israel, right? Oh yeah, I put it on your paper. Those passages on your paper for that. But you know the passage I love? I want you to turn there, and then we're going to take a break, and we'll come back and finish this lesson. This lesson is not finished. It hadn't even really started. I want you to go to Matthew 15. This is one of my favorites. I love this story. I love this woman. I tell you, this, some of the sharpest women you'll meet in the Bible, in the New Testament, are people that didn't belong They just stuck their foot in it. They weren't going to let the door shut. They just put their foot in the door. Right? The woman, the Samaritan woman at the well, you know what she did? She stuck her foot in the door. At some point, she stuck her foot in the door and went, Look, wait, we're not through with this conversation. I love this woman here. This Canaanite woman. We're in chapter 15. This story picks up in verse 21. Let me grab 21. Jesus went away from there and withdrew into the district of Tyre and Sidon. Behold, a Canaanite woman came out from the region, and she began to cry, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. Boy, had, did she do her homework. 
I love this. She's going to a Jesus rally and has done her homework. She has done her homework. I love this. This is no dummy. Have mercy. Have mercy on me. Oh, oh Lord, son of David, my daughter is cruelly demon-possessed. Hmm. He didn't answer a word. His disciples came to him and said, send her away. She's shouting after us. She's disturbing our ministry. <laughs> we don't do that kind of stuff in this church. Today. We don't do that. He doesn't answer. His disciples say, get rid of her. She's shouting out after us. Watch what he says. It's a teaching moment, always to the disciples, just like you here today. I was sent only to the lost sheep. He, he answered and says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. She stepped forward, bowed down before him and said, Lord, help me. He said, you must, you must have misunderstood me. It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Now, those of you that had dogs, this will have meaning to you. Right? It's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. She said, yes, Lord. Boy, is she good on her feet. Yes, Lord. I mean, she, this, this woman's got a purpose to be there, hadn't she? You're not going to dissuade me with any of that religious talk. I didn't come here for that. Yes, Lord, but even the dogs feed on the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Huh? My mother ought to make sure that that little guy that sat by her seat, by her chair, got a little nibble. She always, oh, geez, I dropped that. Oh, I'd go like, you're not feeding the dog from the table, are you? No, I said, oops. Yes, Lord, but even the dogs feed on the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Listen to Jesus. I mean, it, listen, she won his heart, didn't she? I mean, she won his heart straight out. Listen to what he said. Oh, woman, your faith is great. Oh, woman. I got 12 guys running with me. They ain't got a clue. They've got their seminary degrees, and they don't know. What a breath of fresh air to my soul you are. Oh, woman, your faith is great. Be it done for you as you wish. And at that moment, her daughter was healed. Isn't that wonderful? Listen, you know what I love about this? You can touch the heart of Christ. If you think your request is nutty or maybe self-centered or whatever, if, listen, he's impressed with faith. If you will ask in faith, oh, woman, 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 oh, woman, your faith has made my day. I've been slugging it out in the streets and the highway and the hedges. I've been slugging this out, and I got this crew with me. They had, geez. You ought to see what he's been through to get to chapter 15 and meet this dear woman. Oh, woman. That's an endearing title, by the way, for him. We saw it at the cross. Your faith is great. 
You know what he wants to say? You want to impress him? You, you, want, you want to make his day? I mean, you probably don't think, how could I ever, you know, how can you give somebody a gift that's got everything? You want to make his day? You want to impress him? You want him to say, hmm, I love that. You have made my day. Give him the faith that he's given you to start with. Give him faith. Great is your faithfulness, huh? Great is your faith. And boy, did she get it, didn't she? Huh? You think she walked home? Huh? You think she walked home from the rally? I bet her feet hardly ever hit the pavement or the dirt road or whatever she was on. I bet, I bet her feet hardly touched. And listen, she knew what she was going to find when she got home. She knew what she was going to find home. A sane, healthy daughter. You got a need today? You got something disturbing your soul? You got stuff going on in your soul? Needs to be, it's, Ron, I'm, my soul is just in an uproar. Listen, today you get healed. You know how it works? Listen, how it works. Faith. Faith. I know it sounds so too simple, doesn't it? But it's faith in what? Her faith was in Christ, wasn't it? Her faith was in Christ. And this about him, that he was the miracle guy, that he was the Lord, he was the son of David, he was the Messiah, he had miraculous power. Yes, I know he has come for Israel. Aren't there a few crumbs? I'm not asking for a loaf of bread. Give it to the Israelites. I understand that. I'm not asking for a loaf of bread. I'm asking for some crumbs. So we're going to have a word of prayer, and I want you to pray about your life. I want you to pray. You know what it is. Your journey for health, your journey to get well, your journey to get resolution is going to come by faith, and faith comes by the word of God. It's not going to happen any other way. It's not going to happen. You can wish it. You can wish it. You can tie a, a yellow ribbon to your finger. It will come as you take the word of God and live it in and out of your life. You breathe it in, you breathe it out. You breathe it in, it settles you down. You breathe it out, it corrects things in your life. Jesus honors faith that's exercised. Let us pray. I'm going to give you a moment of silence as a believer priest. I'm going to give you this moment. You got stuff going on, stuff in your marriage, stuff in your business, stuff in your personal life. I don't know. Well, where that came from, John? Go ahead, people. Take this moment. I don't know where that came from. The devil trying to distract us. Father, we're thankful for this lesson and for this Canaanite woman. She didn't climb up some other way. She didn't go through the back door. She didn't climb over the fence. She didn't go to some university or some religious school and get a degree and now thinks she's in because she has a degree. She didn't go through some religious system and think that now I'm worthy enough to get there. She came through the front door. She walked right up to the front door and requested entrance. And she got in because of the grace of God and her faith. It's true for each of us here this morning. May this be true in our life, and may it begin right here, right here this very moment. Just like in her life, this was a moment to never forget. A recovery system in her life. 
I pray that for these people here today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go to point two. In John 10, 1 through 6, Jesus taught that there was only one door into the sheepfold. However, the enemies would try in opposition to the door. Now, they knew where the door was. But that would make them customers or sheep. <laughs> they either were there to buy uh, or to investigate or something. But listen, these don't go by the door. They're, they're in opposition to that. The enemy goes another way, any other way, any other way than the door, right? I'll climb, I'll fly over. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how I'll see, but in the context. And so I, I want to, for me, there were four things here that I thought just kind of rung my bell. First of all, the door of the sheep. Jesus said, I am the door of the sheep. And he said, there's only two ways to get into the sheepfold. You can climb over, and if you do, then you're the enemy. Or you can go through the door, and then you're a sheep. You belong to the shepherd. So the door of the sheep, he says, I am the door of the sheep. And of course, that's what we're talking about today. He also talks about the enemy of the sheep. The enemy of the sheep, not just the enemy of Christ. The enemy of the sheep. Because they're going to come for the sheep. They're going to steal, destroy, kill. The enemy of the sheep, notice how he describes them, he who does not enter by the door into the sheepfold, climbs up some other way. He says he's a thief and a robber. He tags them. The thief comes only to steal, he goes on to say, only to steal, to kill, and destroy. In the 10th chapter, verse 5 earlier, he said, the sheep doesn't recognize the voice of, if they don't recognize the voice of the shepherd, they will flee. When a, a strange voice says, uh, kitty, 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 they won't come. Of course, it may be that he called them with it as a kitty, but they, they don't recognize the voice. I thought it was interesting. It doesn't like they freeze or they don't go anywhere. They flee. They see it as a danger. He says, but the shepherd of the sheep, the shepherd of the sheep is the one who enters by the door. He is the shepherd of the sheep. And his sheep, notice, the savior of the sheep, I am the, and he'll say that next week. The savior of the sheep, I am the door of the sheep. I came that they might have life. The enemy comes to take life away, comes to kill, destroy, steal. I have come that they might have life. And they might have that life how? Listen, it's not just that you have eternal life. That's a gift at salvation. But you know what that is? That's divine life. The secret is get the activity of it into your life. Get the divine life active in your life. Get the life of God active in your life. That's the abundant life. This is over and above anything you could imagine. The, the Greek word here, and I... Somewhere I've, I've laid that Greek word out for you. It is we're down in point three. It, it means that this is exceedingly. Now, when you're talking about eternal life, most people, most people just think of eternal life as like human life, you know, in the sense human life. But listen, he's talking about eternal life like the human life that's there, but being able to experience that human life in the most amazing ways. Do you understand that? When he's talking about eternal life, he's talking about the life of God in you. He's talking about divine life and being able to experience that in the most magnificent ways. Right? The difference is, for in the human life, for your life to, to go exceedingly, it's probably according to your expectation or other people's, and you're reaching goals and ideas like that. But still, we have that. I've got the perfect job. I've got the perfect mate. You know what I'm saying? I got the best. I got this. I got that. And what, everybody knows what we mean by having it, having it good. I got a good life. I've got a good this, good that. But I think when we come to 
eternal life, I think we got an idea that it's just some, some kind of idea. And, and not, not, it's like, okay, I got it. I guess, the Bible says I got it. And I guess when I get to heaven, I'll experience what that's like, right? I mean, I think that's the way most people think about it. That's not the way Jesus thinks about it at all. He thinks about it in the same way we might in, in physical life when we talk about having it abundantly, having the good life having a good marriage, having a good job, having a good neighbor, having it good. Well, this word abundantly means exceedingly, uh, above and beyond. And so it is the life of God. Look, it's never too late to get into the abundant part. Let's say, let me say, for example, let's say, like in my case, I got saved when I was 23. Okay? And I, and I got eternal life. I did. From 1963 to 1968, I had no concept. There, I thought I had eternal life as some mystical idea that I'd be, I, I, had, I, I had it forever, and when I died, I went to heaven because I had eternal life. That is true. But it wasn't until 1968 that I discovered that this life was the dynamic life of Christ within me and that I was to have an expectation of what abundant life. See, when I grew up, I understood what a good life was. It was going to be better than the one I had. I mean, I don't care if you're in the richest neighborhood in the world. Your good life is something better than you got. I ran around kids in high school and college that came from both sides, quote, of the tracks, and they all had ambitions above where they were. I mean, they had an expectation of that. In 1968, discovering that there was more to eternal life than this mystical idea that I'm connected with God in time and eternity, and when I die, I would experience that, I discovered in 1968 that there was a whole abundant life ready for me to seize upon and to enjoy and live before I ever got to heaven. That was like strange to me. That was like good news again. That it was. It was like, uh, wow. How does that? How does? How was that acquired? See, how was that acquired? And it, it. And and listen. The wonderful thing about it. Every gate. Every asset that gets you there, has been given to you already by God's grace at salvation, indwelling Holy Spirit, the Word of God the system of cycling, all the gifts that are necessary, and all of the stuff that God has planned within your life. I'm afraid. I hear so many people complain about their life. And I, I ask them, which life are you talking about? And I can tell you, uh, 10 out of 10 times, it is this earthly life they're talking about. They're not talking about the divine life, the spiritual life. When you get them, say, well, would you set that aside a moment? Let's talk about how you're doing over here. Well, I'm doing pretty good, but I'm not doing pretty good over there. They've never understood how to match those. So they think they have two lives. They have this life over here called, I'm a Christian, I go to church. Then they have this life over here. I hate my job, I hate my marriage, I hate my kids, I hate my this and I hate my... But, uh, but I, I know I have to like it, so I'm trying to like it. And they've never merged these two into one. They've never merged them. They live separate lives. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking if you want transformation, you've got to merge these. The divine life is greater than the human life. It's greater than the flesh life. This life is the dynamics of life. If you want to know why God created life, this is it. The one you got in human life is not the big deal. It is the spiritual one. The spiritual one trumps the, f the physical one, the human one. It trumps it. It is so far and exceedingly above it that when you get there, you're going to go like, whoa, whoa, whoa. This life, when I discovered I had to merge those, I had to merge my marriage into this, I had to merge my family into this, I had to merge all that. Listen, that was overwhelming. I'm not, I'm not kidding you. That was overwhelming in my life. 
But I realize that's what transformation is. Transformation is the ability to merge them and be one in Christ. And then when I discovered that, I discovered a lot of turmoil in my life trying to merge those, and I discovered this inner dialogue business. <laughs> I did begin to discover a whole lot of things about merging. No, I, I will give you that because I'm not doing well, Lord. But this one over here, I seem to be doing pretty good. I'm going to keep this one. And so I found myself piecemealing my life over to God. I'm going to give you the stuff I can't control, and it's driving me crazy. I'll give you that. But this stuff I got kind of going pretty good for me. I'm going to keep that. Right? That is not the way it works. I'm telling you. I'm telling you, this may be new to you, this may be news to you, but this is what he wants. And when he's talking about that you may have eternal life, that's one thing. That you can experience abundantly, that's what I'm talking about. And when you do, let me tell you, when you merge them, then transformation goes over, it goes over that. It transforms your marriage. It transforms your, the, the, your relationship with your children, with your business, with everything. There's transformation covers the whole scoop, but you've got to put them under one roof. You've got to put them under one roof. If you're not going to put them under one roof, you're never going to know what I'm talking about. You're going to be in a daze. You're never going to understand transformation. You will never. I'm talking about experience, understand it. I'm talking about epinosis. I'm not talking about gnosis. I'm talking about epinosis. Where you are fully engaged in understanding it, the realities of it. This is what he's talking about. And you know how he's talking about it? Here's what he's talking about. The shepherd will lead you into the pen for safety, will lead you out to pasture, right? And from the pasture will lead you back in. You know what you're talking about? Your security of life and then, the, and then the fullness of life, right? I mean, the sheep love to get in at night. They sleep. They eat. They talk. <laughs> How would you do? <laughs> I did all right. Uh, How are, I don't know. I'm just telling you. They have this little conversation in there. And they go like, well, let's go to bed. It's time, you know. He's going to be up at crack of dawn. Okay, so everybody, they agree. Let's go to sleep. Little ones, too. The next morning, everybody's up. Hey, let's go. And where are they going? They're going to pasture. They're going to feed. They're going to have a good time. They're going to play around. They're going to jump around. And then, yeah. You know what that is? The pasture. And do you know if you read Psalms 23? Psalms 23 is the name of the game. If you want to know about this abundant life for the sheep, there it was. You ought to read that from a sheep standpoint and understand that that's the abundant life in a, in a sheep idea. He who does not enter by the door and he who enters by the door. I am the door and I give them life and the sheep follow me. The sheep follow me. You don't even have to. They don't even have to think about it. You know why? Because I go in for protection. I come out. For food, I go in for protection. I come out for feed. I go out. I drink the I drink the clean waters that he leads me to. I eat the green pastures that he leads me to. I have a good life. I have a good life. I have the good life. That's Psalms twenty three, is it not? And you know what that's about? It's about this. This is exactly what this is about. Go back and read Psalms twenty three in a whole new light in your life. I tell you the truth. John 5, 24, I tell you the truth. That's another one of these. It's very, very, I say to you. I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes has eternal life. Has eternal life. Has eternal life. And he, he is no longer under condemnation. He is passed out of death and into life. I'm not, that's salvation. That's salvation. I want you to experience the abundant life. Of your salvation. This is what time on earth is about. This is what it means to walk by faith and not by sight. This is what it means to walk in the spirit and not by flesh. This is what it means. And listen, when you get into transformational happiness, contentment, joy, peace, and patience, it'll make your other life 
so much more enjoyable. You know, the one that you're just frustrated with tonight, today? You know that life you're frustrated with? The one that you're always saying, well, you know, I don't have this and I don't have that and I don't like this and I don't like that. You got to switch it over. Got to switch it over. Listen, you don't need to go to a psychologist to figure this out. You just got to switch it over. Start switching it over. He's got a whole nother life for you other than just being saved. Where he can bring, where when, when, when he takes you, when he takes you in for the security part of your life, whether it be into the hospital or whatever it is, you've got confidence that you've got comfort. You know he's your great protector. When he takes you out to the pasture and lets you go on vacations and do these kind of things and, and he supplies everything necessary for you to have that abundant. Listen, there ought to be a deep appreciation. There ought to be a deep appreciation. And there ought to be, listen, who go? listen, you ought to be able to go on vacation and not fight. You ought to be able to go and have the things that should be enriching in your life because of the grace of God that's given to you. You ought to be able to go and embrace it because you have this spiritual idea about it. I'm just saying. I don't know what you think eternal life is, but he's, he just reached in and, and brought it into a different level, and I hope you get that. He came to his own, John writes in the first chapter, Jesus came to his own, and those, were his, though, and those who were his own did not receive him. And see, this is where he's going to go to in John 10, 16. He said, but as many as do receive him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. See, now he's going to bring that into another place in John 6, 10, 16. Third, three, Jesus explains five things. This could have been a lesson within itself. Jesus explains five things everyone receives when he enters the only one door of salvation. When Jesus said, I am the door of the sheep. Listen to what he said. He said, I am the door. Now, he told you if you enter a different way, killing, stealing, all that. Listen, he says, I am the door. If anyone, I love that, the woman at the well, the, the, the Canaanite woman. It doesn't matter. Anyone. Anyone who will believe. If anyone enters through me, that is believe. Watch this. Here are five things. One, he will be saved. Future passive addictive of believing. Two, he will go in and out. Notice those words, future tense. He will find pasture. This is what it means to be in the abundant life. He will find pasture, future tense. He will find pasture. He says, I came that they may have life, five, and they may have it abundantly. Notice the word have, that they may have life, present active subjunctive, and have it abundantly. See that? See the word haves? Big deal. That's a big deal, people. Here's one, Acts 20, 32. It's not on your paper unless you write it. But he talks about being heirs with an inheritance. And boy, that's well worth reading. You can read about it, in that was Acts 20, 32, and Romans 8, 17. That's just one aspect. Finally, twice, Jesus said he was the only one door of entrance into the sheepfold. Twice. How do I know it? Look at I want to show you something. Look at verse 7. I'm in, I'm in, I'm in John 10, verse 7. Now you, people miss this. Unless you're a Greek student, or you're very observant in English. In verse 7, he said, Jesus therefore said to them what? Again. That's the word palin. Palin. And what this means is that what he said previously about a door is now going to be amplified. I'm going to talk about that door, but I'm going to amplify it. That's palin. In the Greek language, that's the word palin. I have made reference to this door, that's verses 1 through 6, and now I'm going to amplify what it means. And didn't he do it? And listen, he's not through. Next week, he's going to amplify it again. He's going to say, not only am I the door, I'm the good shepherd. I'm the good shepherd. 
I lay my life down. He's going to tell you what it means to be a good shepherd. I lay my life down. Listen, David, David understood that as a shepherd, didn't he? My, look at He took the bear on when he was only two. No, I don't know. Remember that song? Or three? Took on a bear when I was only three. A Davy Crockett, wasn't that Davy Crockett? Well, wh whatever. Sometimes I just want to sing, don't I? Amplified. It amplified. I mean, David, when he took on the bear and the lion, he put his, he put his life on the line, didn't he? For the sheep. Uh, but listen, it wasn't really on the line because he believed God was greater than, than the, the enemy. Didn't he? He was so confident of God. The, listen, I, I could never do this in my flesh, he would, he would say. I could never do that. I could never, I, listen, I wasn't scared until it was over, and I saw he was dead, and I went, oh, that was a big lion. Oh, that was a big bear. Isn't God wonderful? <laughs> Isn't God wonderful? Isn't God wonderful? What a wonderful thing in life. Listen, that's... The abundant life is where you're just able to take the things in your life that are overwhelming. They're bigger than your life itself. They, they, they on their own would produce fear and devastation if you let it. But listen, you turn your eyes outward, not inward. Inward, you're full of fear and, and feelings of despair. Because, listen, the truth of the matter is the bear in your life is bigger than your life. That's, there's nothing wrong with that. That's the inward look. If you stay with that inward look, you'll stay in fear. But there's good news. Listen, you've got a Savior that wants, listen, he, he will take you in and protect you. He will take you out and feed you, right? Put you in the pit. He, he leads you in, he leads you out. He, he protects you and feeds you and takes care of you. Listen, when you have those feelings in your heart and you're looking inward, and listen, the, the, what you're seeing is not bad. It's not bad, it's true. What you're facing in the way you perceive it is a very fearful thing, both in reality and life. The lion was bigger, I and mean, it was very dangerous, wasn't it? I mean, you wouldn't want to take him home and make a pet out of him. I mean, he'd eat you for supper, and that would be a bad deal. The lion was bigger. But listen, he didn't stay focused on what he was fearful of. He turned his eyes upward. Nothing wrong with what you saw. You saw the reality of the situation. It was fearful. But listen, you don't have to live there. You've been born again. You can live under the great good shepherd who will lead you in and protect you and lead you out. He was, he's not going to leave you hanging out there dry, but you got to do something now because when you looked inward, you got fearful. Now you got to look upward. You got to look to whom your source is. The source of your salvation is still the source of your salvation, no matter what you're facing. He's bigger than your fears. He's bigger than the things that you're scared of. He's the bigger than those things. He's bigger. He's bigger, better, tougher. Right? I mean, this is the truth. But if you look inward and all you see is the bear, then you got a problem. You got to see who conquers all. Listen, listen to me now. Listen to me. We are more than conquerors in Christ. Agreed? More than. We are more than conquerors in Christ. Flip that thing. Hebrews says, put your eyes on Jesus. At Colossians 3, that's Hebrews 12. Yeah, Colossians 3, you know, put your eyes on the things above, not on the things below. The things below scare you to death. They would scare all of us to death. We, we flip it. We flip it and put our eyes on Jesus. He is, 
And when we do, listen to me now, when we do, we are more than, more than, more than, more than, more than conquerors. Whoa. And uh, if you want to know where that Bible verse comes from, I, it overwhelms me right now. Ernie will tell you when class is over. I can't remember where that came from. Romans 8. Yeah, Romans 8. Towards the end of the chapter. Yeah, thank you, Gary. You can uh, talk to Gary about it after class. Give Ernie a break. Well, I think that's enough for today. Let's go home. Let's go home after this word of prayer. We're going to have this prayer, and then we're going to do a pledge. Then we're going to go home. Well, we're going to go someplace. I'm going home. I don't know about the rest of it. Here we go. Father, we're thankful today that we have discovered Jesus introduced a new idea to his disciples and to us. Yes, you have eternal life, but are you experiencing the abundant life? Are you experiencing the, uh, the exceedingly greater than what you have life? That's the life I want to live with. I want to be in that sphere of influence. I, I believe that's super grace living in my heart. I believe that. I, I want us, Father, to go this week and realize that we are more than conquerors. And when we don't think we are, it's because we've looked inward and not upward. It's a simple procedure. If you want to go up on the elevator, you hit the up button. And Father, when we are in a down place in our life, we need to hit the up button. We need to turn our eyes away from what is distracting us from having our eyes turned upward. Set your mind on things above, Paul says in Colossians 3. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Fix your eyes on Jesus, Rome, uh, Hebrews 12. Gary reminds us of Romans 8, more than conquerors. We need to be, we desire to be those people. You desire it more than we do. Encourage our people today. Encourage us to live in the abundant life. To be, have the courage to merge the two lives into one in Christ. And let transformation truly take root in us where we begin to experience abundant, abundant life. And no matter what comes our way, we live in the abundant life. Because we are more than conquerors in Christ. More than. That's a powerful idea. More than. I mean... Most of us would be just satisfied to be a conqueror. But a more than? Oh, boy. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.